Welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here at University Church. It's a pleasure to welcome our speaker, Paul Shrimpton, here to Newman University Church for the second of two lectures on Newman's campaign in Ireland. Last night at Newman House, Paul spoke about John Henry Newman's insight and wisdom and his development of an educational theory for the university formation of young men. He broadened our understanding of the sources Newman drew on in his thinking, as well as his artfully integrated uh, integration of them into a sophisticated and nuanced scheme of education meant for the modern world an integration that coupled a rigorous academic formation with personal and spiritual development. Tonight, Paul is turning his focus to Newman's self-assessment of his frustrating years as the founding rector of Catholic University of Ireland. It promises to be a most interesting follow-up to last night's address. Paul Shrimpton gained his BA and MA from Fellow, Daily Oak, doesn't look like that. College, Oxford, and has taught at Magdalen College, Oxford since 1981. He began researching the educational ideas of John Henry Newman in 1990, resulting in a doctoral dissertation published in book form entitled A Catholic Eaton, Newman's Oratory School. He later published The Making of Man, the Idea and Reality of Newman's University in Oxford and Dublin. He's given numerous talks and papers on Newman and education, as well as on Newman and the laity. His book, Conscience, Before Conformity, Hans and Sophie Scholl, and the White Rose Resistance in Nazi Germany, appeared in February 2018, on the 75th anniversary of the White Rose trials and execution. His critical edition of Newman's university papers, My Campaign in Ireland, which underpins these, this week's talks, were published by Gracewing in 2021 and 2022. Having heard all of that last night, <laughs> and without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the podium uh, our speaker, Paul Shrimpton. I'm very grateful um, for the invitation here, both from the Newman Center's here in Dublin and in uh, Notre Dame. Um, and it's quite an honor to uh, speak here in Newman's University Church. I half feared I might be put in the pulpit, but thank goodness I'm not. Um, that would be a bit inappropriate. Um, the other two volumes um, just mentioned there are two, here are the two green bricks in my hand, running to about 600 pages each. About two thirds of these volumes is Newman's work. Uh, all unpublished, so the original um, document or set of documents called My Campaign in Ireland Part 1 and I had the good fortune to discover Part 2. There was a single bit of paper um, in the Birmingham archive said this must be Part 2, uh, there was nothing underneath it uh, but it set me on the trail and that trail led me to um, quite a lot of um, Newman's own writing. Um, it's about 970 manuscript pages in Newman's, almost all, all but six pages in Newman's hand, yeah, which I had to key in and um, edit and all that. Fabulous, really was. Um, for a Newman scholar to find that sort of thing, it's, it's a treasure trove. Um, and it was only, someone was asking me yesterday, it was only one word in all those pages I couldn't make out. Um, uh, which is just extraordinary. Um, his writing is so clear, even when he finishes the page and starts going round the outside in the margins with the writing tapering down. But once you've read a few hundred pages of his writing, it becomes a bit easier. Now, the, um, let me just say, part one is academic partial documents. This is all about, um, effectively, it's just two documents. Um, it's a long memorandum um, uh, 172 pages long written it's called My Connection with the Catholic University um, and then there's an appendix to that a set of extracts of letters so I'm going to 
call these two the memorandum and the extracts. Uh, there are two um, versions of the of the of the memorandum. Um, let me just say first: when are these composed? 1870 to 1873, and you must remember he left here in November um, 58. So the idea is that Newman writes these substantial documents because he wants to ensure that his legacy here as the founder or co-founder um, and first rector of the Catholic University would not be distorted. Now, he didn't want any of this to be published. Not that he would be against me doing it 170 years later, but in his lifetime or shortly afterwards, and you'll, you'll understand why when I come on to it. Um, so when... I got to say also that the memorandum in here was published eventually in 56, 1956, in, at the very end of something called Autobiographical Writings. Um, and it's there in the introduction were the clues to the appendix which I managed to found, find in the Birmingham archives. Um, right, so the original copy of the memorandum, written in 1870, runs to 155 pages. None of that has ever been in print. Um, a lot of it's copied into the second memorandum three years later. About 40% isn't, and that appears for the first time ever um, as, an, as an appendix in here. Um, the fair copy runs to 172 pages. Now, the extracts, which I'll come on to in a moment, extracts of what? Letters, memoranda, journal entries, is 657 pages long. Um, and not only that, and this is the interesting bit, when Newman is copying all this up 15, 16 years after leaving Dublin, he's also adding on his own thoughts, um, and sometimes in a very forthright fashion. Um, he's giving his verdict, if you like, on his Irish campaign 15 years after leaving. Now, the memorandum and extracts describe and illustrate, respectively, Newman's work in laying the foundation for the university and then acting as its first rector. They contain highly sensitive information and reflections about his dealings with priests, bishops, archbishops, cardinals, and even Pope Pius IX. In analysing the causes of failure and frustrations that he encountered, Newman is not afraid to criticise those who shared responsibility with him, principally his co-founder, Archbishop, later Cardinal Paul Cullen. These candid writings show Newman's toughness and fairness in his dealing with, with others and reveal how his powers of diplomacy were stretched to the very limit as he sought to turn his idea into a reality. While part one of my campaign is the public face of Newman's educational endeavour, part two provides the behind the scenes picture by telling the private reality of Newman's experiences in Ireland. Criticisms of Newman in his Irish campaign, and there are plenty, I'll refer to later. In, in quite a, in, I'll, I'll give it a good go. Um, now, why the heck did Newman um, go to such trouble to compose a memorandum and to copy out these extracts? Um, what purpose did he have in mind if he felt there were far too sensitive um, to be worth publishing. Now the fact is Newman regularly went to his papers uh, every year or two writing summaries and commentaries about them and sometimes summaries of the summaries, commentaries on commentaries, commentaries on the commentaries on the commentaries and I mean that you have sometimes a memorandum which has four, five, six, seven bits added on in, in, in years going by as more as more thought presses have gone on, the fact of inputs from various people he's spoken to, and, and just wisdom, you could say. Now, when he retired um, in November 58 from the Catholic University here, went back to um, Birmingham, he, he had intended to put his papers in order, but life took over. He had a call from convert friends who were married, who wanted um, uh, a Catholic public school for their children, and that was Newman's second big um, education venture. The, the university and the school are the two big ones, and they complement each other in various ways. He was also sucked into a controversy uh, to do with the Rambler. The Rambler was a 
paper set up in 40, 46 by John Moore Capes, a convert from Oxford, and um, it was the it was run by converts to Catholicism, and um, it, it had the biggest impact of any journal at the time with non-Catholics in the country, but it was, it was coming under fire and about to be closed down by Rome, and Newman steps in to, to sort it out. He's the only persona grata to both sides, and in the end, he gets into deep trouble as editor. Anyway, that's a long story, and then he's under a cloud in Rome for the next 15 years. Right, he's also preoccupied with his major philosophical work, an essay in aid of a grammar of a sense, published in 1870. So, 1860s, Newman's busy with the school in particular, oratory stuff, but by the end of the 60s, he's going through all his um, already published works and trying to set up a uniform edition. There'll be 34 volumes in this edition, and by 72, there are 23 volumes published with 11 more in the pipeline. And sometimes Newman, the reason I mention this is because a year later in 73, what Newman does is cobble together two different books on education to make them form the idea of a university. Uh, and you know all about that, so I don't need to say much. So there he is in Birmingham doing all this. Now, he starts in 1870 with the first memorandum, and it is a very messy document, not because I can't read it. It, is it was the most difficult bit. Um, but he, he, his train of thought goes off in one direction, then he suddenly flips and it goes off in another. And it was quite clear he, was, he just couldn't do it. He didn't have the letters at his disposal. He had a small number which he, he drew on extensively, re-quoting, but he, he ran out of steam. He realised he needed to collect the information. And he, he started to do this big time in summer um, 1872. Um, and one particular connection came from Robert Ormsby. Um, he met him at James Robert Hope Scott's house in, in Abbotsford, in the borders in Scotland. And um, yeah, they, they, he agreed, uh, Ormsby, to send you and his, his letters amounting to something like 150, 200. So really a, bit, a big stock. And um, Newman wrote back saying, what a capital history I have found your letters to be of the university campaign. And I think it's that expression, university campaign, which gives its name to these two connections. I've read enough of the letters to see how important they are to me. They bring out turning points, which I'd quite forgotten. So, um, so much so, in fact, that um, in the extracts, Newman quotes from no fewer than 78 of them in all his arguments. Now, over a period of two months, we're now into October, November 1872, Newman organises the whole of his Dublin um, papers collection. I mean, Newman's a squirrel. He keeps everything. <laughs> You've got all his school textbooks, university textbooks, all sorts of things. Um, there are 200,000 items in the archive in Birmingham. It's just extraordinary when you're in there. You don't know what you're going to turn over next. Um, now, there are 2,400 and something in the Dublin collection. So he reads through the whole of this, and this is just at the end of the day, burning in the oil into the night, um, processing it. Um, so he's finished that by November 72, and then he begins on the long memorandum, 172 pages, and then he quotes these extracts, um, eight, uh, 657 pages, He's drawing that information from over 2,400 documents. Now, that's all going into the latter two-thirds of this book. But on top of that, Newman, I mean, when he says he quotes some letters, he doesn't. He, it's a sort of, he, he can't resist improving the language again, even though it's brilliant, top level. So he, it's a, he never changes meaning, but he improves things, he puts things different ways. Um, so anyway... Sometimes that will make a third version of a letter, his original draft, the one he sent, and the version in here, which again is, can be slightly different. Um, now, you need to know something else about this. Um, at that very time, 1872, Newman is putting on paper instructions which he adds to and adds to and adds to and adds to over the next few years about his future biography. He knows it's going to be written. He says, 
quite unrealistically, there should not be an Anglican, his Anglican life shouldn't be touched. He's done that already in his Apologia Pavita Sua. Okay, then he says, if the Catholic life were attempted, other men's shows will be trod on and the life will, it will be answered and a controversy ensue. Newman explains that he has put in order, this is, he writes this down, several large collections of letters which are not underlined for publication, either because they are the letters of others or because they relate to matters which cannot be touched upon without getting into controversy. And he then goes on to say there are four such collections, one of them to do with the Rambler and its successor, the Home and Foreign Review. Second one would be the, the request by Cardinal Wiseman to undertake a major translation of the Bible into English um, and all the mess up there. Um, the third would be the dispute between the London and Birmingham oratories, which has, that one's still not been sorted out. And the biggest by a long, long way was the Catholic University. So he saw from his Catholic life, this was the most difficult aspect to cover. And that is why he spent so long um, writing about it. Now he says, these collections I made with the view of their being used and only used in defense underlined, i.e. if enemies make misstatements or impute motives, these collections are authorities to refer to. Four years later, he reiterates the point, saying, there is very little to say unless at the risk of causing great scandal, controversy, partisanship. Referring to the four, same four matters, he says, I wish all statements which reflect on others to be withheld from publication unless and until reflections are published in any quarter against me. But such publication is not to be determined on hastily or without real necessity. It is only on great provocation, great provocation, and for grave reasons of expedience or propriety that one could consent to reopen the past. Right, I hope your curiosity is <laughs> building up here. Um, now, there are 2,413 items in this particular, this hot topic, if you like, divided into 65 packets. Uh, wonderfully catalogued by someone who used to teach at um, UCD, Teresa Iglesias, a philosopher. Um, they are the collections about the dispute about the vice rector here, one naturally about Archbishop Cullen, one which hardly anyone knows about, the sale of this church and all that happened in that. Um, then his correspondence with the bishops. Um, now, Clearly, there was no way Newman's literary executor could um, William Payne Neville see to the publication of these or even circulation just to friends because Newman reveals his, I mean, he gives his critique of Pius IX's ignorance of Ireland and his doubts about the Pope's practical judgment, his worldly wisdom, you might say. Newman I can't remember, there are two phrases. One is his gift of sagacity, he questioned. And by that he means of temporal matters, not as, as on spiritual matters. Um, that would have been utterly unthinkable um, at the time to, to publish that. And of course, all, exposing all the shortcomings of um, Archbishop Paul Cullen. Nevertheless, all these juicy bits did appear in the very first biography of Newman in 1912 by Wilfred Ward. It's a two volume biography. It was effectively an official one because the oratorians opened up to an extent their archive to Wilfred Ward. And the problem isn't just that, it's the fact that New Ward bases virtually the whole of his coverage of Dublin on Newman's memorandum and extracts which are not representative of his time here. So, um, Newman, sorry, Neville, his um, executor, would have been dismayed in the extreme if he'd lived to see Ward's biography. So how did this come about? Well, the correspondent which I've looked at, it's in St Andrews, um, between the oratory and Ward, shows that Neville 
was extremely cagey uh, about anyone having access to Newman's papers. He was trying to block, effectively stop this chap um, writing the book. But there were disputes within the oratory. I haven't written this down, but I'll tell you, uh, <laughs> it's extraordinary. One of the notes which Newman writes about is the access people have to have to his papers. There is one oratorian, Ignatius Ryder, who is not to have any say on what, what becomes of all his documents on and on the publication of any of them. And the problem was he became provost after Newman died. So what you have within the oratory is a, a provost who's heading up all the decision making and a literary executor who knows in secret he's not allowed to let his provost have any say on what's being published. And that is only part, I couldn't get to the bottom of everything. There was obviously shenanigans going on in there um, because Neville wouldn't agree to meet Ward, even in the oratory. They had to meet in a local pub or cafe somewhere. I mean, so it was not. And, and, and Neville himself is a rather unusual character, very timid. Um, he, ha he had Newman's best interest in heart, but he it was almost overprotective, you could say. Um, now, um, so after Neville's death and shortly later Ryder's death, I think um, Ward got at this, and that is why it didn't appear in the, in the archive under the cover sheet, because he took it, <laughs> he made off with it, and a lot of other things, um, and he used that. Um, now, it was inevitable that all Newman's letters and diaries would eventually be published. It was a 60-year project um, undertaken by Thomas Nelson, then eventually by Oxford University Press, 32 fat volumes. But to put all the most sensitive part out into the public domain 20 years after Newman's death, when many of the people were still alive and the memory of the others were still there, was bound to trigger a reaction. It did, more later. Now, the memorandum and extracts bring a lot of the characteristics of Newman out, that he was a man of action, that he had an extraordinary psychological toughness as well, and obviously showing that he, he was dealing with every aspect of the university. Um, <clears throat> he was also in a very difficult, a complex political situation in your country. I mean, obviously the whole business of nationalism was raging in all the different um, solutions, some more peaceful, some less so. And the split within the bishops, uh, archbishops, obviously you have John McHale, Archbishop of Tume on the one hand, and Archbishop Cullen on the other. Um, and then there were extraordinary um, standoffs between the educated laity, the Dublin lawyers, um, and the clergy. Um, so what I'd like to do is just to, um, to develop one particular point, which is Newman's work with the educated laity. As I say, the Catholic University and the Oratory School in Birmingham are the two main projects he was involved with as a Catholic. He wanted the laity to become an active force within the church and the world, and he set himself to form the next generation of lay faithful. In his words, to fit men for this world while it trained them for another. He saw himself called to undertake this task um, in 1845 when he became a Catholic. And he writes a few years later, from first to last, education, in his large sense of the word, has been my line. I could also add there, he also had a vocation as an Anglican, well, as a Christian, should we say, um, in... Um, which came to, to fulfilment, if you like, in 1826. He became a deacon in 1825 in the Anglican Church, um, no, 24. A year later in 25, an Anglican priest started parish work at St. Clement's in Oxford, just over the bridge from Magdalen, uh, working class parish. Um, he was also interested in, in missionary work and he was trying to work out um, what he thought God's call was for him. Was it in parish work, which is what most of his um, colleagues were going into, or possibly missionary work? His father signed him up for Lincoln's Inn, the bar, one of the four court, uh, inns of court in London, um, but he resigned after a few years. But then he saw, no, in 26, he saw, no, 
my vocation is in education. So he, he saw a third way of being an Anglican um, priest, which was to revive the 17th century Lordian statutes in Oxford, which very high church, which gave the tutor not just educational and pastoral superintendents, but moral and religious superintendents of students. So this was a very religious way of looking at education. But I mean, that's, if you like, a, that's his call 25, 26 to education as an Anglican, and then it's renewed as a Catholic. Uh, and then it's brought, yeah, so it's the education of the laity. Now, um, in, in dealing with the, what's at the heart of this book, which is the, the big character clash between Newman and uh, Cullen. Um, let me start off by saying Newman does list Cullen's, Paul, Archbishop Cullen, I don't think it's irreverent to call him just Cullen, Archbishop Cullen's complaints about himself. Interesting, he, he overlooks one of Cullen's chief concerns. Let me develop this one. It's Newman's approach to discipline. Unbeknown to virtually everyone in Ireland, Cullen wrote to Rome virtually every week. The, uh, I mean, he was, he, he was Archbishop from um, 1850 to 78, that's 28 years. These letters were going out to the Irish College or oh, Fransoni or his successor, Barnabo, who was Cardinal of Propaganda Fide, and we were mis British Isles were all missionary country, all via them to the Pope. When he wrote in, in English, it was meant for just English ears. When he wrote in Italian, it was a it was, um, clue for you pass this on up higher up into the Pope. So these letters were going out every week all about Ireland, trying to make, ensure the right people got him point, appointed, but he's also sending out complaints uh, uh, in about 20, 30, 40 letters about Newman, which Newman was totally unaware of, and these points weren't brought up with him. Newman was too lax. There was no fixed time for students to study. He allowed them to smoke, to play billiards, to attend dances, to go to the theatre, to watch rowing matches. He seemed only to have Oxford in mind and was introducing practices in Dublin which were dangerous for a country like Ireland. Um, this anxiety of Cullen's was so real that at, um, in November 55, just after the end, just as the second academic cycle was about to begin, he had his first breakdown. Uh, a much longer one occurred um, three years later, just as Newman was finishing here. And I, I can't remember, I think Cullen left the country for something like six to nine months to recover. It wasn't just because of the problems here, it was because of all the infighting uh, with priests and <laughs> bishops and archbishops uh, and dealing with the British government as well. Um, now, it could be said that Newman, sorry, Cullen was able to imagine a university along Newman's lines, at least as far as the content and scope of its liberal arts teaching. But as regards as the administration and discipline, his mind was steeped in the workings of a major seminary. And this isn't just true of Cullen, it's not just true of Irish bishops. It's true of the Episcopal worldwide at the time. None of them virtually, except possibly for those in Belgium who started up the Catholic University of Louvain, none of them virtually could imagine um, a place which was not under clerical control as far as administration and discipline. Um, Newman was very much the exception. He thought the university should be undertaken with the active cooperation of the laity. Now, I can pin this down, I reckon. Uh, the earliest I can do it is August 27, when Newman is just 26 years old. In a sermon preached at St. Clement's, not the university church, he writes, the clergy are not to be considered as controlling education in their own right, but as representatives and instruments of the general body of Christians for whose good God has appointed them to the office of superintendents. Now that statement I mean, was totally novel in Church of Ireland, in the Anglican Church, and most certainly in the Catholic Church. Now Newman, sort of half a century, a century before other people are beginning to think that way. On the practical level, Newman had to contend with the high-handed attitude of Cullen, who acted as if he was above the law, and exempt from the normal rules of engagement. 
Cullen thought nothing of flouting the university statutes, which he himself had signed when appointments were being made, um, and were according to, uh, which, according to the statutes, were Newman's prerogative. He trumped him completely. He also irritated Newman by appointing a vice rector, two of them, without even consulting him. And according to statutes, you know, Newman's right hand man, Newman had to have some say uh, to that. Um, so even one of Cullen's um, fans in Ireland um, does say he indulged in nepotism in all sorts of ways, putting his own men instead. His choice of the priest Michael Flannery as the first dean next door on the upper two floors of St Patrick's house was to give Newman countless problems because Newman Flannery was unable, simply unable to manage students. And it was this kind of clerical jobbing, as it was nicknamed, that the laity disliked. Newman devotes um, one of the nine sections in the memorandum to the differences over the selection of a vice rector. And there are just over 60 letters cited as evidence. This is almost legal. <laughs> um, anyway, this is for new people after Newman's died to deal with. Um, now, in one of those um, letters, he relates, and this is this almost, well, it captures it beautifully. Cullen tried to treat him not, and I quote here, not as an equal, but as one of his subjects. There's a whole article written about that, not as an equal, but as one of his subjects. Now, um, this is deeply ingrained clericalism, you could call it, but there was a counterpart to that, most certainly, particularly among the more educated Catholic laity, particularly in the rising professions in Dublin, Cork and other larger towns, characterised by a marked tendency to place professional promotion and social recognition above allegiance to the church. These laymen were contemptuously referred to as castle Catholics. As early as 1848, this is two years before the Synod of Turles, at which it was agreed that the university would go ahead, Archbishop McHale was convinced that the university would fail because, I quote his words, our, our high Catholics are rotten to the heart's core. Our middle Catholics are fast corrupting in the same manner by love of self and place. In a pen portrait of the castle Catholics intended for ears in Rome, the Dublin priest Peter Cooper described this respectable class as conceited, ill-formed, and merely subservient to our heretical government. It lives on the smiles of court and on the hopes of court preference for its own. It is an eminently venal class. Now, what makes that letter incredible is that it comes from someone who, who was very, very keen on Newman appointing lay professors, and he was an exception in Dublin. Now, Newman himself wasn't unaware of this lay clerical divide because Robert Ormsby had, in fact, informed him about this and had told him that the general mind of this class in Dublin was unconsciously imbued with Protestant notions, and I quote his words, caused by the long habit of conciliating Protestants by softening their faith and pretending liberality. As for the aristocratic class in Ireland, Newman was surprised by the lukewarm response um, to his invitations to them to become patrons of the Catholic University. Other than converts to Catholicism, not a single peer would lend their name to the Catholic University. There is a reason for that. They'd all back the Queen's colleges and they explained that if they were seen to change their argument to support the Catholic University, they would appear inconsistent, but whatever. Um, now, in all sorts of ways, um, Newman's, so the point I'm making here is there is this extraordinary clerical lay antagonism going on. What Newman hopes to do is to start a university, as he says, mainly for the sake of the laity. And this represents a shift in, in the whole of the Catholic Church at the time towards um, focusing on uh, not so much because most schools in Ireland, as they were in England, were educating what were called church boys and lay boys together. By church boys, people who were subsidised in a sort of junior seminary. So 
There wasn't a single school in England at the time for the laity only. Newman started that called the Oratory School, and the same was largely the same took place here as well. So to some extent, preparation for the world is heavily compromised in all sorts of ways, not just in terms of the curriculum, but in, in, in what people do, the way they get on, the way they're treated. Um, so they're not being prepared for the world. And Newman's thinking here is really to think of preparing lay people for the hostile Protestant world they were about to enter. Prepare the rising generation of young Catholics to reap the rewards the, um, of the Catholic emancipation and to enter into public life and the professions. This is even apparent in his university discourses, and I'm only going to mention this one point from them. Um, he effectively there, he, he argues that the end of a university is intellectual culture. And in doing so, he's defending the university against um, people burdening it with other ends, practical utility on the one hand, but on the other, religious training and, in, in, and morality on the other. So Newman was faced with two dominant outlooks, each of which showed a marked tendency to use the university as a vehicle for something other than its primary end, which is teaching people how to think or more generally, human flourishing. And in this account, if uh, with this, these tendencies, you distort the education imparted. Now, the, the useful knowledge crowd, you could say, held that education alone was needed to make the public moral, and therefore religious teaching was redundant. Ecclesiastics, on the other hand, had a tendency to be interested in education only insofar as it ministered to religion. And Newman deals with this. He's, he's going, I mean, this is quite dangerous, um, a dangerous argument to come out with at the time. Um, he says, um, he maintains that the proper business of university is not to steel the soul against temptation or to console it in affliction any more than it is to set the loom in motion or to direct the steam engine, be it ever so much the means or the condition of both material and moral advancement. Still taken by and in itself, it as little mends our hearts, but it improves our temporal circumstances. Yeah, that, yeah, that needs a bit of a caveat. I mean, it, it sounds a bit harsh, the way Newman puts it there. Um, now, one thing Newman was constrained with, he didn't realise it at first, the one thing which I mentioned yesterday he didn't deal with here was the collections. Uh, and this proved to be quite problematic in the end. So the hierarchy organised the annual collections throughout Ireland, as well as overseas. Um, so the clergy organised them, but the university was for the laity. Most of the contributions came from the poor, but the university was effectively intended, initially at least, for the better off. There was a problem, therefore. And Newman expressed his misgivings in a letter to the editor of the Rambler. While the priests collect the money, the university can scarcely be a lay institution. As it is mainly for the good of the laity, the laity ought to be the formal movers in the matter. The heads of the Irish church almost ignore the laity, for the laity do very little, even less than in England. They didn't do much there either, <laughs> so less here. In his opinion, you cannot have a university till the gentlemen take it up. Newman realised they'd been sidelined. They were simply expected to cough up the money and send their sons and nothing else. So the voice of the educated laity is, is something which is quite big. It's a major theme running through Newman's memorandum and the extracts. All along, Newman had wanted, and I quote his words, to make the laity a substantive power in universities. Um, He'd been confirmed in his thinking by reports he received that many of the higher class of laity, he writes, would cooperate with the university were it not for the utter want of confidence they felt in the management of it by the bishops. He saw the university as a means to heal the breach between the educated laity and the higher clergy. A slightly long quote coming up. This is a letter to a priest, actually trying to explain the matter. A university, unlike a seminary or diocesan college, 
is preeminently an institution for the laity, and it may be advantageously used as a means of bringing the educated classes under the just and beneficial influence of the church. The bishops ought to be supreme as the sanctioning, controlling power and the ultimate authority. But as the directors of bank appoint a manager, so I conceive will their lordships best provide for the interests of the university and conciliate the laity if in the management of the current expenses they employ one or two able and zealous men of business to be their managers. So entrusting the financial matters to laymen uh, would make sound sense, he says, and besides would interest them in university more than anything else. Instead, and here are, here are the first of several harsh words of Newman, they were treated like good little boys, were told to shut their eyes and open their mouths and take what we give them, and this they did not relish. That is in the memorandum. Um, now, <laughs> Newman's attempts um, to, to entrust the financial management uh, to laymen were deliberately, repeatedly, and continuously obstructed by Archbishop Cullen, and he did exactly the same uh, to, uh, um, to um, Nathaniel Woodlock afterwards for about 16 or 17 years. Um, Newman, Cullen tried to, kept writing back to him to say that he, he knew priests who were, and these are Cullen's words, well versed in the management of temporal affairs intimately acquainted with the state of public feeling in Ireland. He kept putting him off. So I know these priests who can do that. These priests can do that. Don't go to laymen. Um, but one of the laymen on the university committee complained to him, the tendency of all this is to make the university a close borough of clergymen and a clerical college, which was neither the intention or the wish of those who encountered much opposition in trying to establish it. And Newman says... He does not consider ecclesiastic the best advisers in a great lay undertaking. What was so astonishing was that so little use was made of very able and energetic laymen who were on the Catholic University Committee. Two people in particular, Miles O'Reilly, a prominent, prominent politician and educationist, Charles Bianconi of Italian extraction, very successful businessman, Mayor of Clonmel, and founder of Ireland's public transport system. So they're doing nothing. They're twiddling their thumbs. Um, Cullen even manages to thwart Newman's scheme for compiling a list of lay patrons who would simply lend their name. Um, right, I've got a quote there, which is repeated, so I won't say that. Now, he told his successor, Bartholomew Woodlock, the bishops won't further the university till they trust educated Catholics more. So, throughout his time, Woodlock also found that every he was outmaneuvered continuously by Cullen. And even when Archbishop Cullen was negotiating with the British government, he never consulted the laity, not even the professoriate of the university, not even, of course, not the students, but not the former students interestingly. Um, and it was one of the former students, George Fortrell, who with others wrote a memorial in 1873. This might be the fourth or fifth attempt to get a charter. It was under Gladstone's administration. The, the vote on it, which he lost by three or four, toppled the government in Westminster. Uh, Gladstone was trying to do what he could. Um, initially, Cullen was on board and changed his mind um, later. Got cold feet, even though Manning tried to persuade him to go ahead. Whatever, that's a long and difficult story. Now, um, the former students um, join up with the current students and write a memorial. So they go public, first in a letter to one of the newspapers, then they print their document at the end of eight, uh, uh, 73. And they, they effectively say there, they're encouraging the final paragraph of this sort of 30-page document, they're, they're doing this because of Newman's assertion that from the cooperation of students with the superiors of the university in shaping its future, 
he looked forward to the creation of a permanent community of feelings and interest in education and religious subjects which will doubtless foster among the educated laity in the country. Now Newman wrote back when he was sent to cover this, he was absolutely delighted and he wrote a letter which was not in this collection but I've added it, it was because Newman wound this up in May 73, the letter was written in December and it rounds the whole story off so perfectly and I'm reading three short paragraphs because this is, this is priceless. Um, one of the chief evils which I deplored in the management of affairs of the university 20 years ago when I was in Ireland was the absolute refusal with which my urgent representations were met that the Catholic laity should be allowed to cooperate with the archbishops in the work. Now he broadened the argument, as far as I can see, there are ecclesiastics all over Europe whose policy it is to keep the laity at arm's length. And hence the laity have been disgusted and become infidel and only two parties exist, both ultras in opposite directions. I came away from Ireland with a distressing fear that there was to be an antagonism as time went on between the hierarchy and the educated classes. And in the third paragraph he says, you will be doing the greatest possible benefit to the Catholic cause all over the world, not just Ireland, if you succeed in making the university a middle station at which clergy and laity can meet so as to understand and to yield to each other and from which, as from a common ground, they may act in union upon an age which is running headlong into infidelity. That's just extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. And it's just, it's prophetic. It's so true, seeing what has happened, not just Dublin, Ireland, United Kingdom of, of Britain and Ireland as it was at the time, but all over Europe. Now, the failure of the Catholic University has been put down to all sorts of things, lack of a charter, public recognised decrees and endowments, but no, no, no. Newman thought the real problem was to do with clerical control. This is evident from a letter he wrote to Woodlock in 1868. It is essential that the church should have a living presence and control in the action of the university. But still, till the bishops leave the university to it itself, till the university governs itself, till it is able to act as a free being, it will be but a sickly child, even though it has a charter and an endowment. So money won't solve the problem. You need to let the laity get on with it. Uh, in cooperation, in harmony, in a conspiratio, Newman calls it in a certain document, a breathing together. Um, laity and clergy acting together. Right, that's the end of my first two thirds, 60%. Now on to criticisms of Newman. Uh, <laughs> um, now, um, there are people who write about Newman and about the events here uh, and deal with the Newman Cullen relationship um, who don't who ignore the complex situation that Cullen had to grapple with. Now, I'm not, I can't even begin to enter into all that, into reforming the church in Ireland at a time of endemic clerical infighting at a time of centralisation within the Catholic Church, a re-establishing of, of proper ways of doing things. So I think during Cullen's 29 years, there was a tripling of church attendance. Marriages and baptisms were moved into church. Clerics were told to keep out of politics. That was a very slow business. They began to be called father. There are lots and lots of things going on there. It was a revolution, my goodness. Um, but there weren't side, uh, it's not as if there weren't side effects. Um, on the other hand, there have been people who defended Cullen's reputation at the expense of Newman's. Um, while proclaiming even handedness, one particular historian, Colin Barr, takes the view that um, Newman's memorandum is, and I quote his words, an essentially hostile one. Um, Newman believed that Newman treated him poorly throughout his time in Dublin and made an already difficult job near impossible. He blames Fergal McGrath's Newman University, I think partly because he doesn't call it Newman and Anne Cullen's University, uh, for perpetuating the hostile portrait of Irish obscurantism that has become the popularly accepted one. 
Now, Aspar has written so much more than anyone else on Newman and Cullen, it's worth reflecting on some of his criticisms. Barr says that the memorandum was written at a time when Newman felt underappreciated and marginalised in the Catholic Church. True. He argues that Newman's insistence on employment, now we won't hear, this is the juicy bit coming up. There's a whole catalogue, a show, whole shopping list here of criticisms, so listen in. He argues that Newman's insistence on employing Englishmen at university was due to a certain distaste for the Irish. His numerous derogatory comments about them show that in modern terms, Newman unquestionably harboured racist views towards the Irish. This explains why Newman made so few friends in Ireland. Newman's dealings with the young islanders were naive. To make friendly relations with Frederick Lucas and to appoint men like the lawyer Charge Pickett could only be interpreted by Cullen as a calculated snub. Though Newman claimed he wished to remain neutral in the Irish church's internal battles, it is difficult to credit if he truly believed he would be successful. For Newman to aspire to neutrality was simply ludicrous. Those are um, Barr's words, and possibly the result of his own bitterness at the Archbishop's shabby treatment of him. Newman was never able or willing to commit time or energy to either the Catholic University or the Birmingham Oratory. In arranging his resignation, all Newman's old bitterness over how he'd been treated came welling to the surface. So like other Newman critics, Barr simply misunderstands the purpose of this memorandum. Newman uses it, he says, to lay the blame for, at Cullen's feet for the failure of the university and to set his case out at length. Well, as I just explained, this wasn't for public consumption at all. Um, so Barr says, Cullen obstructed him at every turn, treated him appallingly, starved him of money, wrecked the university, too narrow-minded to understand what Newman aimed at. But as I've explained, Newman did not compose the memorandum for publication. Um, the point is, yeah, in, 18, in the 1870s, Newman didn't think he had long to live. He thought he would die quite soon out of overwork, not surprisingly. Um, he did so much, and that Cullen would live much longer. Um, and the opposite happened. Cullen died in 78, long before Newman did. Patrick Moran, who was commissioned, who was a nephew, half-nephew of Cullen, to write um, a life of his uncle, never finished it. Instead, Wilfred Ward's biography came out. Ward's biography is, is more problematic than I've mentioned. He's strong on Newman's intellectual battles of the day, but very weak on his educational ventures, both in Birmingham and here. His almost exclusive reliance on the memorandum and disregard from any correspondence not in the extracts gives him a very partial view of his subject. It meant that Ward focused on the difficulties and understandings rather than the normal, ordinary day routine running of university life. And so Ward speaks of the hopelessness of the university from the outset, about how Newman reflected on it bitterly in the 1870s. The university years, Ward claims, did much to break Newman's spirit, as he was not strong enough in temperament to handle the problems he encountered. The accumulating trials led to the feeling of crushing disappointment. Overwhelmed by sadness, even bitterness, he became deeply despondent. And then, as a singularly sensitive spirit embarking on an impossible endeavour, he was ill-suited to the task. Ward's po portrait could only have emerged by neglecting the vast, vast majority of Newman's Dublin correspondence and dwelling solely on the problems analysed in the difficult bits. He was rightly, he's rightly been criticised for providing a distorted image of Newman's personality during his Dublin days and for starting the, the line that Newman was hypersensitive. Significantly, the Birmingham Oratorians blocked the publication of a third volume, which was going to be made up of letters only, because they felt, as Charles Stephen de Sain says, that what was missed out was the natural, energetic, humorous and practical man they had known and lived with. So, um, relying on 
limited resources, Newman represents Cullen as well as Newman um, and ends up um, saying that according to Cullen, um, he re Cullen really wanted a quasi-seminary and um, he argues it's one particular page Ward makes four different mistakes, yeah. So he argues that um, universities, sorry, I've lost my right here. Yeah, right, it, 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 Cullen's aspiration was that the university might become a center for enforcing ecclesiastical rule in Ireland, okay. And also on the same page, he says, Newman preferred laymen to priests. He didn't, he just preferred whoever was best at the job. He did appoint some priests for non-theological subjects. Um, he regarded nationalists with special favour. He certainly didn't. He did employ them, providing they were willing to put down their arms, so to speak, the poetry they'd written, distance themselves, and promise not to bring politics into the university. Um, and he um, argues that, against Cullen, that he wanted to set aside Cullen's ideas for the free habits of Oxford undergraduates. Well, Newman had the opposite problem when he was a tutor in Oxford. Um, the place was out of control, so Newman didn't want, he wanted something in the middle. Now, the problem is, um, all these things go to, um, yeah, Cuthbert Butler's Life of William um, Ullthorne, he, he says, and this, this line's been perpetuated endlessly, that all Cullen and the Irish Bishop wanted was a glorified seminary for the laity. That's a standard line. So that all comes from Wilfred Ward's biography, and that is misleading too. That was, they, they had a much better idea. It was going to be partially clericalised, sure, but it wasn't quite what it says there. But this has been taken up typically by David Newson in Convert Cardinals and others. It was the Protestant press at the time who nicknamed this university Dr. Cullen's College, the Seminary in Stevens Green, and the Ultra Monstein establishment, among other things. So the problem is with Ward's biography, it starts, it, it, it sort of provokes and polarizes and gets going the whole Cullen Newman debate. The next one, so it came out in, 20, in 1912. Within months, uh, the, the Irish historian, lawyer, architectural historian, Constantine Curran, who attended le lectures next door with James Joyce, um, he argues for, he champions Cullen's cause and argues for his side of the story to be told as well. He blames Newman for the rigidity and unpractical nature of his ideas and spoke of him of entering a confusing welter of cross currents and conflicting purposes with a temperament admirably adapted to misunderstand. He asserted that Newman never seriously gave himself to a thorough, and I'm quoting here, objective consideration of what Ireland wanted in the matter of the university, and that the main reason for his resignation was a sense of discouragement, of impending failure. So, <laughs> all this begins an Irish anti-Newman narrative of a rector who was obsessed with Oxford, ignorant of Ireland, and temperamentally unsuited to the task. Terence Corcoran, an ardent cultural and political nationalist who taught here at UCD, he did publish um, two collections of Newman's discourses in 29 and 30 for use by UCD students, but he, he added his own eccentric contribution to the anti-Newman um, narrative. But at the same time, he, um, he realizes Ward's mistake in using Newman's papers and correspondence only. And he argues that the real Newman is not to be found in the despondencies, the petulancies, the recurrent suspicions, the besetting subjectivities, which, is our, which are the staple of these exorbitant registers of specially sensitive temperament, but rather in the real record of his Irish achievement. Um, but again, he didn't realize this, what the purpose of the memorandum was. William Stockley, a Sinn Féin politician and academic, brought another version of Irish nationalism to bear. He wrote approvingly of Young Ireland and knew his appointment of several Young Islanders here. Uh, Corcoran's view was championed later in England by Alan McClelland, 
and he bases five chapters in his English, Roman, Catholics and higher education about the Catholic University focusing on uh, Wilfred Ward's work. Now, Colin Barr, to give him credit, dismisses McClellan's contribution as a sustained and bitter attack on Newman, and yet he himself regurgitates several of McClellan's distortions, such as, and this is a difficult one, that Newman either could not or would not grasp that he was rector of the Catholic University of Ireland. This was a point of uh, confusion, shall we say. Uh, it wasn't sorted out at the time. Um, or that the memorandum was written to pin the blame on others for the failure of the university. So other criticisms of Newman's years in Ireland are dwell on his super sensitive character, his poor administrative skills, his propensity to overspend, obsession with Oxford, his reluctance to get to grips with the political situation here, his failure to address the needs of Ireland. He was incompetent, touchy, stubborn, failed to maintain a working relationship with his patron. This is all Colin Barr. And these character flaws provide a compelling explanation for the university's failure. Right. Now, uh, many of these criticisms persist because of ignorance of the full story. Uh, and um, hopefully this volume will, will dispel some of these things. The problem is many of these things have been recycled within the last 10 years and two of them in volumes um, published by Oxford University Press. I flag up all these criticisms and more in my introduction. Just to alert the readers to the counter arguments to Newman's persuasive prose. But I don't answer them. I don't need to. Newman does himself almost entirely. You just have to read it. They're all there, the answers. Had no Irish friends? <laughs> he writes, the only two Irishmen I didn't get on with were Archbishop uh, McHale uh, of Chewham and Archbishop Cullen. And you just see people writing, Irishmen writing to him, academics, you were like a father to me. They, they keep in touch with him years, decades after he's left. Only a few things, do, uh, on occasions do I have to come to the aid of Newman and only in a footnote as in the instance of the charge of racism. Not living in a politically correct age, <laughs> in the 1850s, Newman readily uses terms like paddy, he uses it twice, and Yankee, by the way. Um, I explain this by saying um, a well-known educational reformer at Eton and later at King's College, Cambridge, Oscar Browning, stayed with Newman overnight at the oratory in 1866 and writing to a friend he says he was struck with Newman's marvellous copiousness of language, his abundant fluency, but also with his use of harmless worldly slang that he might not appear priggish or monkish. And you just have to imagine that. Here is someone who writes such polished prose but if he's going to have any sort of um, sympathy or empathy with students at the school level and university, he's got to come out, he's got to drop the gown and get onto their level. And he does so. He uses ordinary language and short sentences, not these extraordinary paragraphs of Victorian prose. So, and uh, that just captures it beautifully. Um, I also, okay, um, yeah, there's one criticism that Newman wasn't to explain to the reader that it's all very well Cullen saying you need to compromise, but <laughs> Newman had agreed, and he points this out early on, he was being given carte blanche to, 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 to uh, this, this wholeness of education to put it into practice, it, not to compromise. Um, he, was, he was given free reign from the beginning. And anyway, um, Archbishop Cullen was in Rome um, preparing for the Declaration on the Immaculate Conception in December 54 and remained there because of problems to do with nationalism until July the following year. So he wasn't around in the first academic year. So Newman had, had to sort of free reign to some extent. Um, so when Cullen got back, he realised he'd lost, he'd really completely lost control. 
But it's also the problem that having been granted this generous liberty, Newman, unlike most of the clergy round him, round Cullen, refused to be cowed into submission. By the end of the third academic year, Newman's frustration was evident. Now, where is this? He's writing to Ormsby, Dr. Cullen has no notion at all of treating me with confidence. He grants me nothing. He has treated me from the first like a scrub, and you will see he will never do otherwise. He has never done anything but take my letters, crumple them up, put them into the fire, and write no answer, and so with everything else. It's a bit hard, but anyway, he was, it was a bad day, clearly. So a year later, before visiting uh, Dublin for the last time, he sums up his feelings. Dr. Cullen is the only one I have cause to complain of. He has been and is ruining us. He will do nothing. Let us do nothing. He gives no answer to questions. Or he implies he grants and then pulls you up when you have acted. He is perfectly impracticable. Um, I'm coming to the very end now. Yes, it's Ormsby, who was probably one of Newman's most trusted colleagues here at university, who was privy to all his frustrations, attuned to everything going on. He offered Newman sympathy, and this is, um, I get the year right, in January 58, in his final year. Your, your unsparing exertions in the whole scheme and, and idea, and every point of it worked out step by step with nothing to blame yourself for, statutes, lectures, classes, sermons, the church, and all its cost and trouble, with the provoking treatment you have sustained, and all this me merely the visible points of a whole world of business and vexation, I can only wonder you have not broken down under it long before. Now, Ormsby is an Englishman, so I think we need an Irishman, and I take the lawyer, John O'Hagan, who was also aware of how shabbily Newman had been treated. And um, O'Hagan writes in 56, I fear your associations in connection with Ireland will dwell very unpleasantly in memory as a country which never understood or appreciated you. Well, as regards the Irish professors in university, and I speak of those I know as laymen, it is quite the opposite. We have always felt that you only wanted power and freedom of action to make the institution march. It is painful not to be able to do anything beyond expressing sincere sympathy. Newman annotates this letter with a very pungent comment in November 1872. If it was not Ireland that was unkind to me, the same thing would have happened in England or in France. It was the clergy, moved as they are in automaton fashion from the Camarilla at Rome. That's strong language. Um, he spoke um, plainly in 1859 when he heard that a move was afoot in university to move the university away from the Louvain model. And he writes, if this happened, it would become simply priest-ridden, meaning men who do not know literature or science will have the directing and the teaching, and as a result, the professors will be tr treated as simply scrubs. As these snippets show, and there are countless more, um, Newman comes alive in his letters. Reading them is the nearest we get to listening to his conversation. Newman himself believed that a man's life lies in his letters as he wrote to his sister Jemima, biographers varnish, they assign motives, they conjecture feelings, they interpret Lord Bewley's nods, they palliate or defend. Many consider Newman's sermons to be the finest of his writings. Others mention the Apologia, the development of doctrine, the idea of university, the grammar of ascent. But there's little doubt that it's in his letters that we come closest to meeting the man himself. Um, and I know from having keyed in all these letters manually, um, it's a joy going through them. You, you encounter this man in the extracts. They bring to life the founding rector, dealing with people, it's Newman dealing with people and problems, encouraging and inspiring those around him, resolving difficulties, clashes of personality, elaborating on his grand ideal in the process. And the letters from his co-workers here, whether they're Irish, English, Scottish, uh, one Frenchman, 
Um, they, sh they show profound respect and confidence in him, if not affection. Um, these men knew from personal experience how much weight he had to shoulder and how little support he received from others. Finally, before I take questions, I should say, I mean, this is clearly biased towards Newman. <laughs> it is Newman. I've explained it. Um, I'm not arguing Cullen's case here. But if, if, if we're in danger here, people, I don't want any of you to, to sort of think and to enter and to react to what I've said in terms of it is either choosing between Newman and Cullen. I mean, these two are extraordinary characters. They are the co-founders. The university couldn't have happened with either of them. Um, they made very impressive contributions to the life of the church. They both lived holy lives, sought to apply the Christian message according to their different talents and um, mindsets. One was a man of his time. Newman, of course, was uh, a century or two ahead of his. Um, so instead of attributing the failure to either one or the other or sharing it, possibly we ought to point the finger of blame more towards the upper and professional classes, both in Ireland and in England, for their apathy in not supporting Newman and Cullen not supporting their university with their patronage, money, or even sending their sons. That's the end of my text, but on request from yesterday, you wanted me to, um, <laughs> to mention one particular quotation. So here we go, I did find it. Um, Newman's writing to Ormsby, Dr. Cullen wishes well to the university, but while he is ignorant as anyone how to do it good, he is not the heart of any perfect confidence in anyone. Um, Dr. Leahy, Patrick Leahy, will trust a man. Dr. Cullen will not. Here is the Origo Mali, the origin of the evil, an archbishop without trust in anyone. I wonder he does not cook his own dinners. <laughs> he doesn't get much stronger than that. Um, <clears throat> and this, sorry, I did this, I thought of this this afternoon. Um, yeah, I have a whole footnote here on how Newman and Cullen helped each other later on in life in the 60s and 70s. And it's wonderful to see that. When Newman got in trouble, deep trouble, um, for a sermon on the Pope and the Revolution, which was <laughs> denounced to Rome for to be put on the index, Cullen came to his rescue. Uh, that's in 1866. And assured the Pope of Newman's orthodoxy. Um, in a pastoral letter, approving of Newman's letter to the Duke of Norfolk, Newman describes him as the great and pious and learned rector of the Catholic University whom Ireland will ever revere. A year after Cullen's death, when um, in his reply to the, to the address from the rector and senate of the Catholic University in Ireland, um, Newman said, I ever, ever had the greatest and truest reverence for the good Cardinal Cullen. I used to say of him that his countenance had a light upon it, which made me feel as if, during his many years in Rome, some 40 years, all the saints of the holy city had been looking into it and he into theirs. I'll finish there. <clears throat> Thank you for that uh, illuminating talk uh, and interesting exploration of a, a time period that is kind of lost to us. And we have many, as you said, many uh, stereotypes of it, but uh, only a few have explored the depths. <laughs> but uh, now is an opportunity for us, to, uh, anyone who wants to ask uh, a question, as we said last night, uh, we don't have a whole lot of time, so if you could keep your question brief and tight, uh, we can um, share it. So if you have one, just raise your hand and I'll come to you. We are recording, so uh, we want to make sure that people can hear it. Thanks very much. That was a wonderful talk, very enjoyable and informative. I just wanted to ask you what you think Newman would think about the synodal process that's going on at the moment, given his views on the laity and the clergy. Yeah, um, there was this online seminar about that about 10 days ago. I only listened to uh, one of the three presentations. It was brilliant. Jennifer Martin, speaking from Rome, 
she's from Notre Dame, in fact, in the theology department there, is a talk about the consensus fide. Yeah, this is, a, a lot of people are hitching Newman to their bandwagon here, you see, and um, there's even a 2014 document, which I need to go and look at on, I think, titled Consensus Fide, the Consensus of the Faithful, um, and she, I think, was advising a bit of caution on the way it's been used. Newman is the main person cited in this document, um, and she thinks it's a bit wobbly, so it, it's a bit of loose wording of Newman based, he takes from Italian from an Italian, the big Italian theologian, Rome Peroni, who drew it from Adam Mola, a church historian. It's a very complicated thing. And she explained, because she'd read the Newman original on that, how, it, for, for, because it, how to, okay, so how would you, it's this whole thing of, so, <laughs> how does the church react to the laity in the thinking? So Newman got into deep trouble in, in May and July, 59, just after leaving here, when he, made a comment that um, in, in the Declaration of the Immaculate Conception, the faith, the laity, sorry, the faithful had been consulted. And um, Newman goes into the theology of that. But that was a time in the, he, he in particular goes back to what the period he knew very well, his, the fourth century Arians controversy, where the laity were totally rock solid and orthodox, and the majority of bit, bishops were heterodox. A very unusual situation in the church. And Newman talks about this, the, the whole of the faithful together remaining uh, true to the church's teaching and that being a guarantee. And there's an infallibility in that, not just in the, in the Pope teaching. So this is being cited, you see. Now, what does Newman mean? Could we talk of a consensus fidelium these days? And the problem is, if if people aren't living the faith well, if they haven't studied it properly, if they're absorbing so much from a hostile environment, it's very difficult, really, to speak of, of that same idea. So that's one of the things which is being talked about. This is, you're, you're going into deep theology, and to, and to, but Newman is being hitched to, to the synodality thing. I, I'm afraid, personally, I haven't actually followed it. I'm simply praying for it. Um, I mean, the best I can do. There's too many things to, but I mean, yeah, a lot of people want Newman uh, to, yeah, especially with the uh, development of doctrine. But many things he, it's a peculiar thing that in his own time, it, 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 it's hard to imagine he was, he was most definitely persona non grata for a good 20 years, from 59 all the way through to 79. And even then, his writings were very suspect. He, he, he was, his writings were eclipsed when there was revival of Thomism under Leo XIII, and some of his works, when they were published in German, had to have a commentary, uh, a caveat put onto them, because they were, they were doubtful. So they, it was, I mean, people didn't really know till the mid 20th century, and even then not fully sure in many cases whether they're truly Catholic. He, he just wrote from a different mindset, coming from an Anglican world, heavily patristic, not scholastic. Uh, but gradually, people have begun to realise that his personalism and other aspects of him is a wonderful foil. And I know I'm speaking here in front of a, <laughs> a wonderful Dominican, but a wonderful complement to Thomism. Um, so we need that thinking. Um, but Newman's also difficult because if you quote him selectively on anything, my goodness, you go into deep trouble. Because all the time he's playing, I mentioned yesterday he's a prophet of equilibrium. This is the head of the bishops worldwide, Mark Coulet, Canadian, retired, I think, a year ago. But, uh, yeah, he spoke on, on Newman in Rome the day before the canonization. Um, so it's very difficult. Newman is not an easy person to get into. I mean, he's, he, he, yes, for any scholar going in, you've got to be very careful. So people are just readily quoting Newman out of context and things. You've got to look at it in the whole. And there aren't many people who are able to do that. Why? Because you have 32 volumes of letters and diaries. You have um, 38 major books. 
and virtually every of them is making a major contribution to some line of thinking, and you have a lot of unpublished material which is still out there. And we're still in the business of processing this. But Sorry, thank you. I, I've diverged, <laughs> moved around there. But yeah, this is being talked about. I think we're going to hear more in the coming days and weeks. Um, but that's an... Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Paul. That was great. Um, small question. Or what do you think was Newman's greatest virtue and his greatest vice? His greatest virtue? His greatest virtue and his greatest vice. And do they, what does that, are they linked? Does it say something about his personality? Yeah, I mean, yeah, when I read the life of a saint, I'm always very keen to know what their leading vice is, what their dominant defect is. Yeah, what did they struggle against? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, unfortunately, Newman destroyed most of his prayer diaries, but we still have 100, 150 pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Intellectual pride, I think, is just a recurrent one, but he's battling at that from a very, very early age. Uh, my goodness. And he has some, his second, if you like, conversion of 27, 28, when he's realized he's been sucked into a rationalist type of theology privileging mind over heart. He then, his sister dies, financial worries, new provost of Oriel to be elected, and several other things. He's a university examiner at the time, overworks. He has a mental collapse. But I mean, he, he writes all that out. And um, yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, so it's wonderful to see. So I think for academics to see that, someone of his colossal intellect of uh, it's such an unusual one as well. It's in incredibly difficult to pigeonhole that. And his talents, I don't know, um, there are just so many of them. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's the way heart and intellect work together. I've just thought of that. Why not? Heart and intellect, no, very, very important. He says we're not thinking beings, rationalists, we're breathing, energetic, willful, emotional people. So he, this is the beginning of a sort of personalism and things. He's a pre-phenomenologist feeding into Max Scheller and all sorts of other people. As a, yes, you would be able to tell far better than me. So I don't know. Um, he, he's a doctor in, of the church in the making and he will be in fact soon, I think. So yeah, an all-rounder. Oh, wonderful. We have time for one more. Any? Okay. Thank you very much. I'm concerned with ways in which we can contextualize Newman today. Okay, you talked about fear and frustration. How will Newman address this fear and frustration as human conditions today? just wanted to say something on that. Oh. He'd say, um, it's nothing. It's happened throughout the whole history of the church. Every council, there's a sort of meltdown. Um, they're awful things to study. <laughs> I would hate to. I mean, <laughs> I've just been reading about it this afternoon. Um, I reread over the summer his um, letters from 69 to 72 about the First Vatican Council and all the shenanigans there. My goodness me. Um, absolutely extraordinary. Um, so, yeah, there's the human element He's going on all the time. Wow, it's really difficult. And he was living through it. He was advising people who were changing their minds about become coming to full communion with the church some people were losing faith in christianity people who'd become catholic thinking of reverting to becoming anglicans priests who'd been excommunicated all sorts now what's extraordinary about newman in these maybe 100 150 letters is how every different person gets a sort of bespoke answer it's just extraordinary newman enters into the difficulty of the person and gives some sort of... So he's just extraordinary the way he pulls it together. He is worried himself. He is famously an inopportunist in the First Vatican Council. 
and wrote a private letter to his bishop, which unfortunately was passed on and published in the Times and caused a heck of a controversy. Um, got him into deep... Well, he was pleased in the end, uh, but no, he, the ch the, yeah, the world is a difficult place. Um, he knew from his, his deep study of Nicaea, so you just have to take... <clears throat> um, he was going to write... His first book was going to be on the history of the councils. It would have been uh, 18 of them as an Anglican. Um, well, the ones... The Anglican Church, I think they signed up to eight or nine of them, but he was going to do the history... Of the, then he was, it was moved on to, um, it was in a series, then it moved on to Nicaea 328, but it ended up being a history of the Aryan controversy. So 18, so 328 to Calcitron 381, I think it is. And in that space of time, the majority of the bishops in the church were heterodox, whereas the laity were rock solid. But what an extraordinary thing there after the first major council, the church goes into a period of sort of meltdown. Um, so he, he's seen all sorts of problems. So, yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's everywhere in his writings. He's always stabilizing people and saying, hang in there. Um, we need faith, deep faith. I mean, God will work it through properly. He's a great, he's a wonderful consoler uh, and I suppose an intercessor now you could say for people who are wobbly and I think we all are to some extent of what's going on every person I ask who comes out of Rome says don't ask too much just pray <laughs> um, so yeah okay that's what I'll do um, but Newman yeah he, he he wouldn't have been too unruffled with what is going on at the moment I mean that um, so good will come out of it but he he effectively says you, you need at least half a century after every council for the dust to begin to settle. Um, and also, he's, it's almost as if everything going on in the, ch the, ch the church can make mistakes in all sorts of things. And he, he says this quite readily. He has no problem with that. Uh, but in terms of major statements on faith and doctrine, no, no problem at all. Um, yeah, that's... Uh, I mean, Newman's fully on board there. So although he was an inopportunist, didn't see the, the points of declaring infallibility, he reasoned that if this was happening, um, it must be because there's some great evil impending which would need this definition and an age of great apostasy, which in fact effectively did happen. But one of the things there was there were 80 bishops who left the First Vatican Council early. And the question was, six nine months later would they would they go back on a decision what was going to happen and this was live action Newman writing and what what is going to happen to these bishops in the end after about a year nothing happened only one or two objected there were a few excommunications or other but I mean not much at all and the dust settled and everyone was happy uh, but it, it's needed a hundred years or so to, to realize what, what the purpose of that was um, yeah, and uh, yes, I don't know. I mean, I think one of the great things when, if, if and when Newman's made a doctor of the church is his, his um, teaching on the laity. One of the reasons I brought that out is I'm actually writing a book on Newman and the laity because I, I think he was probably the, um, the person in the Catholic church, but a leader also in the Anglican church on um, a under, full understanding of the laity and which was, came out in the 64 documents of um, Lumen Gentium in particular, which is ecclesiolog ecclesiological, and a year later, Gaudium et Spes, those two as well as, oops, sorry, <laughs> not my glasses off, um, ap ap Apostolicam Actuositatum, the Apostles of the Laity, those three he has a big, big influence in, and that's, yeah, and we have to thank people, the Dominican Eve Congar, who helped enormously with the Lumen Gentium one. Um, anyway, sorry, I, I sort of veered there off track, but I think we're still, we still haven't um, absorbed and thought through properly the documents from the Second Vatican Council, so I'd, I'd switch the emphasis there away and to say the church really needs to go back there and, and to, to draw out much more. I think that's what Newman would say from that council, which contains 
in all sorts of ways, indirectly, much of his thinking. Right. And I'd like to uh, thank Paul Shrimpton uh, for his words both tonight and last night. It's a yeoman's effort to put together two uh, substantial talks, and we thank you for it. This, uh, I don't want to speak for Dan, but on uh, behalf of both Newman Centers, both at UCD and the one affiliated with Notre Dame, I want to thank you all for coming. This is our second year that we've put on a Newman conference or a talk in, this, in the fall, and uh, we've already started discussing ideas for the future. Uh, we look forward to meeting with you and being with you. It's, it's wonderful to have you here. We will be gathering. We'll have some uh, refreshments afterwards behind the curtains. I uh, invite you to stay and continue the conversation. Perhaps ask mm -hmm. Paul another question if you have it. Mm -hmm. Anything? No? no? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.